I'm really delighted to, to welcome Greg Hannon, who, who is a, a real giant in, in small RNA biology. He has pioneered RNA interference and has received uh, many awards. He's a, a, a member of the National uh, Academy of Sciences and, uh, of course, after 20 years in Cold Spring Harbor, uh, Cambridge was lucky enough to recruit him, where he's currently uh, a professor at Cambridge University, and he's, he's based at the Cambridge Research Institute. And uh, I, I welcome Greg for, for your keynote lecture, and we're looking forward to hear about uh, everything uh, that you have to tell to us about RNA and RNA biology. So, welcome. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I was actually looking forward to coming today to see Andy Feinberg again. It's been a few years. Um, and I didn't realize what uh, a trial it would be for him to get here. Apparently, he was jumping fences and dodging the Sanger guard dogs and, you know, actually showed up half naked, which is... So I, I really appreciate you making it, Andy. I know that you'd be disappointed if I didn't make a joke about you. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a picture of Andy earlier today. Um, okay, so what I want to tell you about um, for the next 40, 50 minutes or so um, is work that we've been doing um, really about over the last decade. I actually realized the other day that this is the longest I've ever worked on any one thing, um, which has been really focused on trying to understand the very special roles that small RNAs play um, in germ cells, and in particular, um, the roles that those small RNAs play in guarding germ cell genomes um, against uh, mobile genetic elements. And we've worked over the years in a number of different systems. Um, really, we initially started this um, looking in the male germline in mammals. Um, most of what I'll talk about today um, came from our work on the female germline in Drosophila, but um, we, we sort of intermingle uh, with studies of these two major models um, also studies of other species, C. elegans, I won't talk about that today, and this is one of our new models, which is a regenerating flatworm called Macrostoma. Now, we have been interested in, in small RNAs for many years, and we got interested in um, sort of small RNAs in the germline through studies that we did a number of years ago, which essentially purified the effector complex of RNAi and showed that the argonaut proteins um, were really the core component, the core engine of the silencing machinery. It's the argonaut proteins um, that um, envelop uh, the small RNAs that serve as sequence-specific guides in this process. Um, and the argonaut proteins also carry out the active silencing itself, at least in some manifestations um, of small RNA-induced silencing, where, um, as we showed in a very nice collaboration with Limor Joshua Tor, um, the argonaut protein itself is a nuclease that uses the small RNA as a guide to recognize and cleave its substrates. And, our lab and the Tushel lab and the Zamor lab um, particularly have, have, have um, led us to understand quite a bit about the biochemistry of this reaction. Now, Ar Argonauts um, come in several distinct, or, or they, they fall into several distinct clades. And so there is the Argonaut clade, which was named um, because of its, close, or its the closest um, uh, relation to the founding member of this whole family, um, which is the Arabidopsis argonaut-1 protein. Um, and the argonauts tend to be, at least in animals, ubiquitously expressed. There are often three or four different argonaut proteins that are found in all cell types. And though they specialize to, to one degree or another, they tend to bind small RNAs that are produced from double-stranded precursors. And these are the, the microRNAs, um, which play a role in gene regulation, and also endogenous siRNAs. Um, it's also the argonaut family of proteins that engages um, when we artificially induce RNAi um, by delivering a small RNA or construct. But, but we became interested a number of years ago in this um, animal-specific clade of argonaut proteins called the peewee clade, which was named after a founding member that was initially characterized by Hai Fan Lin um, in Alan Spradling's lab. Now, these, um, these argonaut proteins were different. Um, in that they showed a very um, discrete pattern of expression, almost exclusively found in germ cells, um, although in some cases they're found in the somatic compartment also of the gonad. Um, they can also be re-expressed in cancer, though um, the physiological significance of that, I think, remains unknown. So, so we became interested in, in what this clade of peewee proteins did, 
Um, and to get an initial clue, we, we looked to the genetics. And so Peewee was initially uh, named for its phenotype, P-element-induced wimpy testes. And so you can see in Drosophila, loss of Peewee protein um, shows a, 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 a sort of gonadal atrophy phenotype. Um, and these flies are completely sterile, actually, both male and female. Um, we saw a very similar thing when we knocked out what we now know is the uh, presumptive ortholog of the peewee protein in mammals, um, and that was done by Michelle Carmel when she was a graduate student in my lab, um, where loss of this mammalian, one of the three mammalian peewee proteins, also caused um, a defect both in uh, fertility and spermatogenesis, but also a morphological defect in the testes. So we were interested in, in what role these proteins were playing, what was the, the, the underlying biology that led to these phenotypes. Now, I think that probably the first clues to this came from work in Drosophila, um, which have three uh, distinct peewee family members. Two of them, aubergine and ego3, are exclusively cytoplasmic and germ cell specific, though they have slightly different localization patterns if you look at them in detail within the cytoplasm. The third family member, peewee, is a nuclear protein that's found not only in the nuclei of the, the germline lineage, but also in the nuclei of these somatic cells, these somatic support cells that surround um, the developing germ cells. And that point, I think, will become important later, if I remember. <laughs> so, so in order to understand the biological functions of these proteins, we look to um, the biology we knew of um, RNAi, small interfering RNAs, microRNAs, and figured that by understanding what small RNAs were bound to these proteins, we could get clues to their target because presumptively they were sequence-specific guides. So Julius Brennecke, was, when he was a postdoc in the lab, um, did a very simple experiment, which was essentially to immunoprecipitate um, these three uh, argonaut proteins with antibodies that had actually been laying around in the freezer for a few years. Um, and he found that each one of them bound to a discrete size class of small RNA, with um, ego3 uh, being the smallest and peewee being the largest. And actually, very recent and beautiful work from his lab um, has finally, I think, solved the mystery um, of the, dis the distinct size preferences of these proteins. But what was important to us at the time was not um, the, the size of these small RNAs, but their sequence content. And when we looked at that, we found that um, the vast majority of small RNAs that co-immuno precipitated with peewee family members um, actually were um, corresponding um, to um, to mobile genetic elements, to transposons. And this was true whether you looked at um, peewee and aubergine um, or ego3. And so this immediately, along with some, some work, uh, some microarray hybridizations that were done by Phil Zamor's lab, pointed to a, con to a role for these peewee proteins and their associated small RNAs um, in regulating transposons and suppressing transposons. Now, transposon control is absolutely essential. And Work that had been done over many years and actually also many more recent studies have demonstrated that in animals, if you lose control over transposons, you're sterile. In every model that we've been able to look at to date, or at least there's a strong impact on fertility in every model that we've been able to look at to date. This, I like this because this is a classic example which shows that loss of control over even a single transposon is sufficient to cause completely penetrant sterility. And this is the case um, of the PM hybridogenesis in Drosophila. And so in this case, if you take um, a wild-caught male and cross it to a lab-strained female, the progeny are sterile. And they're sterile because this female fly does not have the P element that's donated by the paternal genome. If you do the reciprocal cross, then the progeny are fertile. And I'll come back to why we think that is later. But that this, um, this work actually just really emphasized to us the point that even a single transposon, um, loss of control over even a single transposon is sufficient to wreak havoc. Now, the, the problem of transposon control is actually quite formidable. So transposons are diverse in their sequence. Drosophila has, I think, something around 140 different transposon families, which are not particularly, uh, which don't show any unifying sequence features. Um, transposons um, resemble genes. They're RNA polymerase II transcripts. They're polydentylated capped. Um, 
nothing to really distinguish them based on their expression patterns. And they also use a variety of different movement strategies. Some are cut and paste, go through and, and others go through um, an RNA intermediate. So the question was really how were transposons discriminated from genes, sort of you know, self from non-self, if you want to think about it that way at the genomic level, and then selectively silenced. And so we were interested whether we might learn from studying these small RNA pathways, you know, what was it, what is the fundamental property that allows, um, that, that allows organisms to distinguish transposons um, from their protein coding genome. So the first um, hint came from um, looking at essentially the generative loci that give rise to these small RNA populations. And so this is a, a typical Drosophila chromosome. And here we're just plotting transposon content along that chromosome. You see lots of um, copies of different transposons in the euchromatic arms. These are often full length, potentially active elements. Um, Drosophila telomeres are made of transposons. I'm not going to talk about that further, but we also find that there's a, a very um, strong enrichment for transposon content in the pericentromeric heterochromatin. And often in this context, um, transposons are, are broken, they're divergent copies, they don't look like, um, like they have the potential to be active. This is more of a transposon graveyard. Now, if we compare mapping of transposon content to mapping of pi RNA density along this chromosome, you see roughly a similar picture, and that's to be expected, because these are all multi-copy elements. So a pi RNA that matches to this locus might match to many others as well. And it's certainly a pi RNA that matches to this euchromatic site is not necessarily derived from that site. And so to get at this question of, of where pi RNAs came from, um, we did the analysis a little differently which was to ignore all of the multi-mapping small RNAs and focus on only those which were sufficiently polymorphic um, to map to a unique site in the genome. And in that case, the picture clarified tremendously. And what we saw was that those uniquely mapping pi RNAs tended to, to arise from these discrete genomic locations, um, often but not always in pericentromeric heterochromatin. And in fact, they're the uniquely mapping pi RNAs um, collect here if you ask whether these multi-mappers can also be attributed to these loci. Many of them can. So it looks like there are discrete um, regions of the genome that give rise to these small RNA populations, and we um, call these pi RNA clusters. Now, um, there, there are quite a number of different clusters. As I said, they often actually map to this pericentromeric heterochromatin, often at the um, euchromatin heterochromatic boundary. And, but what was actually most informative about this is that we could look in the literature and we could find that some of these pi RNA clusters actually mapped to loci that were previously demonstrated genetically as transposon master control regions. And I'll just give you one example of that, which is a, a gene that was called flamenco. Now, flamenco is, it was known, it was mapped um, to this kind of pericentromeric heterochromatin on the X. And it was known based on both induced and um, natural variation that this locus exerted control over um, a number of different retro elements of the gypsy family. And um, a number of labs, the Pellison lab in particular, had spent a lot of time trying to find a protein coding or a protein repressor of this family. And in fact, um, the, the year that we really discovered what flamenco was, they, they sort of mapped this gene proximal to DIP1, which is one of the last genes before the centromere on the X. Um, but of course, when they mutated, or when they isolated a mutant in DIP1, that wasn't it. Instead, um, flamenco is a non-coding RNA locus. And I suppose, if it ever comes up, um, had, we been, ha had we been more savvy at the time, we'd have called it a long non-coding RNA, because it is quite long. So this is about a 200 kilobase locus, if it ever goes back. Computers are slower in Cambridge. Um, OK, so this is about a 200 kilobase locus. Here's the euchromatic arm, the centromeres over here. And this is basically just packed full 
of copies of those gypsy family retro elements that this locus, um, that, that this locus controls. And in fact, you see small RNAs generated from all along this locus. And if you integrate P elements near the, the euchromatic um, end, the euchromatic proximal end, you have an incredibly strong polar effect on small RNA production throughout the locus. So a P element insertion here wipes out small RNA production 200 kilobases away. Now, flamenco is unusual in that it produces pyronase only from one genomic strand. And it does this such that the, that the RNAs it produces um, are almost overwhelmingly antisense because this locus has collected transposon insertions um, in an orientation that points away from the centromere, points essentially toward the presumptive transcription initiation site. So that a long, perhaps 200 kilobase transcript from this will generate this continuum of um, antisense transposon information, which can then be, pr which can then be processed um, into pyronase through mechanisms we're really now coming to understand. So as I said, flamenco is unusual. Um, a typical pyronase locus in Drosophila generates um, small RNAs from both genomic strands and contains transposons that don't show an orientation bias. And so you would imagine that in this scenario, there would be an equal mix of sense and antisense small RNAs derived from transposons corresponding to the insertions in this cluster. Um, but that's not the case. Now we do know that, and just as an aside, that those two sort of varieties of, of pyronae clusters actually have different expression patterns, right? So the flamenco locus is expressed exclusively in these somatic cells that are the support cells around the developing germline. And they load the peewee protein, which as I mentioned earlier, is a nuclear protein um, that is the only one of the three that is expressed outside the germ cell compartment. Whereas in the germline, many clusters uh, produce small RNAs from both genomic strands, load all three peewee proteins, um, and form a system that in many ways is much more complex and adaptable than that um, ex that acts in the soma. So as I said, um, the configuration of um, pyRNA clusters, their, their random orientation of transposons, generation of small RNAs from both genomic strands, predicts pretty much a 50-50 mix of sense and antisense species. But if you look at pyRNA species in general, they're overwhelmingly antisense. And I've just represented this here for two IPs, Peewee and Aubergine, where red, and this is a whole list of different Drosophila transposons, red indicates um, antisense bias, green indicates sense bias. And so for Aubergine and Ego3, the overwhelming tendency is to have antisense small RNAs. But if you look at Ego3, it's exactly the opposite pattern. So it can somehow figure out what sense and selectively bind to that. And, and this immediately suggested to us that there was some interrelationship between sense and antisense RNAs in this pathway. Because if you look at the places where AGO3 switches its preference, the exceptions to the rule, you see a corresponding switch in small RNAs that are bound to Peewee and Aubergine. So this suggested at least to us that there was some information being passed uh, between these proteins. So digging a little deeper into the structure of these small RNAs, we noticed a couple of different things. So first of all, we had shown previously that pyronase in mammals um, are overwhelmingly enriched for U at position one, and that's what we saw for Peewee and Aubergine, but not for Ego3. Ego3 showed um, a completely random um, distribution of five prime nucleotides. We also noticed that if we compared these antisense species to this sense species in bulk, we saw a very characteristic relationship between sense and antisense RNAs in the pathway in that they overlap by 10 nucleotides on their five prime end. The antisense ones in Peewee and Ob here enriched for U at the five prime end. The sense ones in Ego3 overlapping by 10 nucleotides had an enrichment for A at position 10. Now if we looked at this and knowing what we knew about argonaut biology, this immediately suggested that these argonaut proteins here might actually generate the five prime ends of these sense species 
because when an argonaut protein uses a small RNA guide to bind its substrate, it cleaves the target exactly 10 nucleotides away from the phi prime end of the small RNA guide. And so, so that led us to, to a model which has, I think, been validated now um, through quite extensive follow-up biochemistry, um, where Peewee and aubergine loaded with antisense transposon content, presumably derived from um, pyRNA generative clusters, from pyRNA clusters, um, recognize mRNAs, transcripts of active transposons, and essentially cleave them in a conventional RNAi reaction. So that generates this five prime end, and what's different, where this diverges from RNAi, is that that five prime end becomes the five prime end of a new small RNA, in this case loaded into AGO3, derived from the transposon mRNA itself. Now that's largely useless for silencing, right? Because it's the wrong orientation to recognize transposon mRNAs. But what it can do is recognize pyRNA cluster transcripts which contain antisense transposon content and cleave them. And this reaction, again, generates the five prime end of a new small RNA, which gets loaded into Peewee and aubergine, essentially regenerating the small RNA that initiated the cycle. So we call this the ping pong loop. And this is essentially what we think a way for the system to incorporate information from the active um, set of transposons in any given organism and essentially skew um, the endogenous repertoire derived from pyrene clusters to, be, um, to, to, to enrich it, to target those elements which are most active in an individual or in a particular developmental stage, or at a particular developmental stage in a particular cell type. Now, to kind of summarize that and, and, and quite a bit of other work, um, this sort of leads us to a, a, a three-part model for transposon control, at least in germ cells. So there is a genetically encoded repertoire, which is essentially an organism's definition of what a transposon is. And that's embodied in these pyRNA clusters. These are transcribed as long, single-stranded, non-coding RNAs that are then processed into what we call primary pyRNAs um, by a machinery that involves a phospho phospholipase D family nuclease called zucchini, again, a collaboration that we did with um, structural biologist Limor Joshua Tor a few years ago, a couple years ago. These primary pyRNAs engage the ping pong cycle, and the ping pong cycle generates secondary pyRNAs, essentially acting as a post transcriptional gene silencing mechanism and consuming transposon uh, mRNAs and um, pyRNA cluster transcripts in the process. Um, we also showed a few years ago that. These small RNAs are vectors for epigenetic information. So looking at these instances of P element and I element induced hybrid dysgenesis, we could show that these complexes in their bound small RNAs are passed through the maternal germline, inherited by progeny, and it's actually this maternal transmission is essential for the ability to control those elements. If you disrupt this, it doesn't matter what repertoire the fly has in its pyRNA clusters, they cannot gain control over those elements. And we think that, that um, this is probably a, a general principle work from the Brennicke lab and the Zamor lab has really shown that these, or at least implied that these inherited species are really what bootstraps this whole mechanism um, in every generation. That's a hypothesis that we're trying to test now by trying to interrupt this inheritance process. But as you can imagine, that's really quite a difficult thing. So we've been interested then in trying to elaborate on this pathway, really understanding each biochemical step in detail. You know, how, what, what is it that identifies these pyRNA cluster transcripts? Again, RNA polymerase II transcripts, polyadenylated. You know, what is it that triggers their incorporation into the pyRNA pathway that's essential for forming this transposon definition. Um, what are the biochemical mechanisms by which pyRNAs are made? And as I said, we're making, I, I think, a fair amount of, pro of progress in that. And, and also, we want to understand the effector mechanisms. How precisely do pyRNAs silence their targets? And that's what I'll spend the rest of the talk on today, talking about a recent um, story. So transposons is, are in Drosophila, 
um, and probably also in mammals, are silenced by post-transcriptional and transcriptional silencing mechanisms. So I described a post-transcriptional silencing mechanism just a few minutes ago, which is this ping-pong cycle, and here's sort of a more recent and more complicated um, version of the model. But basically, the ping-pong cycle embodies a mechanism for post-transcriptional silencing, right? Some, something akin to RNAi, um, but something that goes beyond RNAi and its adaptive um, nature. Um, we know that in flies and in the male germline of mammals, um, transposons are also silenced at the transcriptional level. And here we knew a lot less. Um, work from our lab and from Julius Brennecke's lab suggested that peewee proteins with their small RNA guides likely recognize nascent transcripts at target loci, but no one has actually ever been able to chip a peewee protein to its target locus. And so we really don't know if this is true, does peewee get here, um, what are these other steps, what other machinery does it recruit, and, and how does the very um, transposon-specific pyrene pathway interface with the more general um, silencing machinery of the cell? And so that, those, are the, that, that, those are some of the questions that we've been interested in. And that led us a couple of years ago um, to try to build a comprehensive catalog of all pyrene pathway components. And so my lab um, did two different screens. We did a transcriptome-wide screen in vivo in flies of about 11,000 different fly lines um, with double-stranded RNAs targeting a variety of different uh, ovary-expressed proteins. These were from the VDRC collection in Vienna. And we also did an in vitro screen. So it turns out that those somatic support cells that surround the developing germline of Drosophila um, have a cell culture analog that was generated many years ago in Tony Mahowald's lab. And so that was actually really revolutionary to the field when that model became available because we had something that was you know, sort of more amenable to quick manipula manipulations and hopefully, ultimately, to biochemistry. And so Ben Check and John Priel did the in vivo screen. Felix Murder and Paloma Guzardo, when they were graduate students in the lab, um, did a transfection-based genome-wide screen in these ovarian somatic um, support cells. Um, Julius Brennecke's lab also did the in vivo equivalent of this somatic screen, again using the Vienna collection in flies with a different driver um, than we used here. And so basically, like many genetic screens, we got hundreds of hits. Um, in this case, we characterized them very carefully in multiple different ways. So every uh, one of the um, double-stranded RNAs that we used was tested by qPCR for multiple transposons. You don't want to know how much that screen cost for qPCR reagents. It was astronomical. Um, we probably could have bought uh, a qPCR company for the amount that we spent. Um, every in vivo um, measurement included tests of fertility. Um, we did pyRNA profiles and RNA-seq on every one of, I think, something like 170 hits from um, the in vivo screen and about 50 hits um, from the cell-based screen. And, and the whole idea was to try to integrate that information and essentially just assign each hit to a different step in the pathway. So for example, you know, if we never made pi RNAs to begin with, we knew we were in this you know, sort of initiation part of the pathway, where genes might have something to do with the definition of pi RNA precursors um, or with the, the, the processing machinery that resulted in them being loaded into an argonaut. Um, we, could all we could also discriminate um, effects on the ping-pong pathway, because we can, um, by looking at these specific characteristics, this 10 nucleotide overlap, 1U10A, et cetera, um, we can tell when this part of the pathway is selectively inactivated versus primary biogenesis. And we could also um, look at mutants, which we uh, defined as silencing effectors, because pyRNA production, ping-pong, everything was fine, um, but transposon expression still changed. So um, what I want to focus on now is just these effectors. And so um, we were interested particularly in the transcriptional gene silencing uh, part of the pathway. So in this case, we were looking for hits where pyRNA levels didn't change, transposon expression went up, 
went up both in the germline and the somatic compartment. Because remember, the somatic compartment is driven by a nuclear peewee protein only. And in fact, in that context, those somatic support cells, only the transcriptional arm of that path, the pathway operates. And so one such, um, one such hit in the screens was this gene CG3893, um, which we named Asterix for some French comic book that I had never heard of, uh, but now I'm stuck with it. Um, so Asterix had the exact phenotypes. So if we looked at um, PyRNA production, HET versus mutant or knockdown, whatever you want to do, PyRNA levels don't change, but um, oh, essentially all of the transposons become derepressed in the mutants. Now, Asterix, as he is in the comic book, is apparently small but mighty. It's a zinc finger family protein um, expressed in, in, it's a member of a, a larger family of zinc finger proteins um, with, which have a particular kind of zinc finger which tends to bind RNA rather than DNA. Um, this is the only member of the family um, that is uh, particularly overexpressed or preferentially expressed um, in the germline. And in fact, if we make a mutant, as predicted, um, we see this gonadal atrophy phenotype and completely penetrant sterility in a way that is predicted by these changes in pyrene levels. Now, what was also very important to us is that this is a bona fide pyrene pathway component rather than a, something that is more general, a more general downstream component of a you know, sort of generic cellular transcriptional silencing machinery. And we got both kinds of hits in the screen, but we really wanted to focus on those that are pyronase pathway specific. And so this is just a representation of a number of different hits um, that appeared both in the germline and somatic screen, um, upregulation of a variety of these different transposons. But what's important here is when we look not at transposons, but the number of differentially expressed protein coding genes. And so, for example, WINDI here, um, which is a cofactor for a, a histone methyltransferase that I'll come back to later, had a fairly specific effect in that it, it, it had some impact on gene expression. But if you look at asterisks here, there's almost no impact on protein coding gene expression, despite its tremendous impact on, on um, transposon silencing. And then there are other genes, there are nuclear pore components and things that show very pervasive effects on, um, on protein coding expression um, in addition to their effects on um, transposon expression. So Asterix was a good, um, a good candidate for an effector protein. Um, and so we thought, you know, if it is a, a, a component of these peewee complexes that target nascent transcripts at um, at target loci, it should be a nuclear protein, which it was, that's shown here. And if we looked um, at, if, if we looked at um, histone methylation, particularly H3K9 trimethylation, over a number of different transposon consensus sequences, as we see with loss of peewee, you see loss um, over all of these different kinds of transposons um, in the asterisk mutant. We also know, though I'm not going to show you here, that Asterix forms a protein, uh, protein complex with peewee in the nucleus. So it seemed like you know, this was a good candidate for this part of this nuclear silencing engine. So given previous results that, again, suggested maybe that um, these proteins recognize RNA rather than DNA, we set up this assay where we created a reporter locus and we, we inserted into the 3' UTR of this reporter a number of box B binding sites, which can then be recognized by the lambda N protein. And then we hung off this lambda N protein in a variety of different fusions, genes that we were interested in, potential uh, effector components. So we tethered asterisk to this locus. We tethered peewee, a peewee control that doesn't actually localize the nucleus. And essentially nothing showed any level of repression. So we could, we could presumably deliver these straight to this reporter locus, and nothing happened, which was slightly disappointing, as you can imagine, after all the money we spent on qPCR. So we thought, OK, you know, maybe we're missing something. Maybe we're missing a component. 
And we went back to the screens and we mined for more of these things, you know, which, which showed this effector signature, um, which ultimately, and I don't know if I'll show you that or not, um, were nuclear proteins, components of peewee complexes that might be that key mediator that when brought to that locus would silence it. So Yang Yu, uh, postdoc in the lab, focused on this gene, CG9754, which we've named panoramics. Panoramics is the, I guess, the proper French version of the mentor of Asterix, who's the druid who empowers uh, Asterix with his, with his phenomenal strength, I guess. Um, this was one of the strongest hits in all three screens. So, you know, if you looked at the Brennecke screen, somatic cells in vivo, you look at our screen, um, somatic cells in vitro, you look at the in vivo screen, this gene scored at the top um, of almost every one. It has that, um, that characteristics of, of an effector protein. Um, if you look at pyRNAs, they don't change if you compare um, a heterozygous versus a homozygous mutant. It doesn't matter whether we use uniquely mappers or multi-mappers. Um, it has effects on transposon expression that are very similar to peewee. If you compare it to peewee, the differential expression, so this is, so we're not expecting anything to shift here if they're identical, right? So they've already shifted in both, and the shifts are relatively, the shifts in abundance of steady state RNA for all these transposons are almost exactly dead on even, whether we knock out panoramics or we knock out peewee. Um, this doesn't, we get the, exactly the same result if we look at nascent transcripts by GrowSeq. So it really looks like this is something that's acting at the transcriptional level to repress transposons. And, and as I showed you for Asterix, um, if we mutate panoramics, we get a loss of H3K9 uh, trimethylation um, here. This is peewee for comparison. Um, and again, these are just mapped over um, transposon consensus sequences. So it really looks like a TGS effector component. So what happens if we stick it to the reporter locus? And I suppose I wouldn't be um, rambling on about this if something hadn't happened. Um, so something did happen, yay, we didn't waste a lot of money. Um, and actually, what, what I still find it relatively remarkable what happened, uh, which is that if you look at luciferase protein, we see more than a thousand-fold repression if we tether panoramics to this nascent, or to this transcript. Um, this is almost exclusively at the transcriptional level um, because if you look at um, mRNA derived, or sorry, the translational level, uh, no, sorry, transcriptional level. So if you look at um, mRNA derived from this, measure steady state mRNA or by GrowSeq, um, you still see a very substantial, more than 100-fold repression. We think that there's a little bit of inhibition by, of translation by tethering this to the, um, the three prime UTR of the transcripts that actually do make it out of here, which I think explains the slight difference between these two assays. Now, what's important for us as well is that if you do this, and I'm sorry, this is an in vivo assay, right? In Drosophila ovary, the reporter is integrated into the genome and the flies express in ovaries the protein that's being tethered. If you test this system in something else, head, carcass, um, you get almost no repression. You get three, five-fold repression. So whatever's going on here to silence this locus at the transcriptional level um, requires components that are gonad-specific. So the repression by this is dose-dependent, so it depends on how much panoramics we deliver to the locus, and we can vary that by varying the number of box B sites. So three box B sites gives 10-fold repression, 10 box B sites gives 10,000-fold repression. And so this is very sensitive to the dosage of panoramics at the locus. It also requires that this um, reporter be present in a chromatin context. So if we do this by transient transfection into these ovarian somatic sheath cell lines, we get very little repression, just a few fold. In fact, almost nothing, two fold here. And this is just a control where Vitek Filipovitz had shown years ago that if you tether AGO1, which is the microRNA binder uh, in flies, you get a translational repression. But again, we get almost nothing in the transfection context with panoramics. But again, very strong repression if we have this in a chromatin context. 
Now, our hypothesis was that this silencing was driven by the recognition of nascent transcripts at target loci. Um, and so to test that, we made a variation on the reporter where we essentially um, integrated the box B binding sites um, into an artificial intron that we placed um, within the reporter transcript. And in this case, we still get fully penetrant repression if we put these in, a, in the intron versus if we put them in the three prime UTR. And since splicing is co-transcriptional, this is a very strong indication that the, the, the sort of action of this protein is co-transcriptional at the locus um, that's being repressed. So this is a very specific effect. And so if we look at steady state RNA or if we look at nascent RNA by GrowSeq and you compare um, a control, untethered versus tethered, we only see two differences. We see the reporter go down and we see our, um, our tethering construct expression go up. Nothing else in the genome changes significantly. And again, this correlates with the deposition of H3K9 trimethyl marks at the locus, which is kind of a hallmark of PV-induced silencing. Now, what you'll notice is, so here's the box B binding sites, but we see spreading actually in both directions of H3K9 methylation. Now, those of you who are still awake will notice that we don't actually see anything over the promoter. But actually, that doesn't mean that it's not there. It means that we're blind to it because somewhat foolishly, I guess, um, we built this construct with the melanogaster uh, ubiquitin promoter. And so there's a bunch of copies of this in the melanogaster genome. So we actually have no ability to uniquely map um, chip reads to the promoter section of this construct. And YY is busy uh, rebuilding this with either, I think, the Yakuba or the Erecta ubiquitin promoter so that we can really now see um, whether H3K9 methylation spreads from these binding sites um, all the way into the promoter region. So the question then was, okay, if Peewee and Asterix are recruited to loci and they bring panoramics in, and panoramics is the driver of transcriptional silencing, who does it talk to downstream? So does, how does panoramics in a, uh, interface with sort of the general silencing machinery of the cell? And so having this reporter assay allowed us a very simple way to go and at least get some early indications of how that works. And so what YY did is he went back to the screens that had been carried out. He pulled out every protein from the screens which had been um, annotated to have anything to do with um, transcriptional silencing or chromatin. And then he tested whether mutants or knockdowns of those affected the ability of panoramics to silence the reporter. And this is starting to give us an indication of, of sort of how this pathway works. So he found two relevant complexes. He found an H3K9 methyl transferase, and that, uh, that's eggless, which is SETDB1 in mammals, and WINDI, its cofactor. He also finds an H3K4 demethylase, LSD1, and its cofactor, um, and H HP1, which is obviously a reader of these marks. And so we th we're not sure which of these two um, is sort of the proximal signal. Um, it could be that one comes before the other, or it could be that, that both are recruited um, simultaneously through uh, mechanisms that we don't quite yet understand. So what I think we've started to come to is an, an understanding of at least what the core components of this um, transcriptional silencing complex are. Certainly PeeWee and panoramics, um, certainly panoramics gets recruited by PeeWee. We're almost positive asterisk is involved as well based on some epistasis experiments. And, you know, this brings us back in some ways to, so, you know, if recruiting this, which is likely co-recruited with Peewee, silenced the reporter, why didn't Peewee silence it? And so, again, we, we think we just have a hypothesis for that. Which is you can think about this, you know, this is an incredibly dangerous complex. So if it were to go and sort of bind willy-nilly, everywhere it touched would be silenced. And we think that it's incredibly potent, and, and that's the reason we can never chip it. Because any time you have a, nas a slight bloom of nascent transcripts from, from something, Peewee goes in, silences it, and destroys its binding site. Now that we know something about some of these downstream effectors, we can test that hypothesis. But we think that one of the safeguards in the pathway 
is that in order for this complex to actually enforce silencing, it requires base pairing between the guide and the, and the target. And we believe that that's gonna cause a conformational change in Pee-wee and there's structural um, evidence for the Argonaut family proteins that there are profound conformational changes that happen on small RNA binding and target engagement. So that's not such a far-fetched hypothesis. So we think that this is a safety mechanism, but if we bypass that by directly recruiting panoramics, then we can get silencing without um, recognition of a small RNA. So, as I said, um, transcriptional gene silencing happens uh, on transposons both in mammals and in flies. In flies, it correlates with H3K9 trimethylation. In mammals, it correlates with DNA methylation. And so we think that there's probably a very conserved um, uh, sort of arrangement to this machinery where in flies, peewee, in mice, mewee too, recognize these targets. In flies, there's asterisks. The um, mammalian ortholog of this is um, GTSF1. And we think that these probably do um, induce silencing by recruiting this same set of, of orthologous factors in both contexts. Frustratingly, you can't find this protein outside of flies. So there is no obvious mammalian ortholog, at least based on primary sequence, for panoramics, but our bet is it's there and we have a number of different ways um, that we're going about trying to find it. So I'm gonna finish up there and just kind of summarize a few things. So what I've tried to do today was to give you kind of a general flavor for how these small RNAs um, in recognize transposons and induce their silencing, a flavor for their, um, you know, their epigenetic roles that they themselves can serve as vectors for epigenetic information, but at least in mammals can also set heritable um, DNA methylation marks. Um, though what I've talked about really is a pathway that's animal specific the concepts that are embodied by this pathway are very general in terms of mechanisms that organisms use to control um, parasitic genetic elements. In fact, if you think about the arrangement of the CRISPR-Cas pathway in bacteria, I remember the days before CRISPR was so hot, they used to get up and say, we're just like the bacterial pyRNA pathway. They don't do that so much anymore. Um, but you know, even if you look to plants, um, RDDM driven by um, small RNA classes, for example, in AGO4, um, show these sort of same characteristics. Each one of these has an encoded repertoire that feeds the pathway. It has an ability to optimize the inhibitory mechanism. And, and some, at least in some cases, there is epigenetic inheritance of that information. Now, just to make one final point, I started, or at least sort of started by raising this issue of how difficult it is to distinguish transposons from protein coding genes. And I told you that was one of the key questions that we were trying to answer, and then I've ignored it for the whole talk. And so just to come back to that at the end, we think that the key here is in this encoded repertoire, and that the one thing that distinguishes transposons from protein coding genes is that they move. And so our model, and this is supported by some um, genetic experiments that we've been doing um, is that a new transposon invades. If it's a good parasite, in other words, not super active, then that animal survive or that animal can reproduce. A bad parasite, something that's too active, is likely a terminal event, at least evolutionarily. And that transposon will hop around until it hops into one of these clusters in which case it becomes part of that transposon definition. And so since transposons will hop into these clusters, in fact, in flies, some of them are even hot spots for transposition, um, and genes don't. We believe that that's really the, the sort of underlying basis by which organisms, at least mammal, or animals, recognize transposons and distinguish them from protein coding genes. Um, so I'll just stop here with a somewhat boring last slide. Um, but so the, I tried to, to mention all of the folks who did the work that I talked about as I went along. Hopefully I didn't miss anyone, um, but that's sort of the PyRNA team for the last um, nine years or so, eight years. Uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs>
fantastic lecture and insight into pi RNA biology. Questions? Yeah. yeah. So how do you think that the, the cluster itself, how do you think the cluster itself wound up with all the elements in the same direction? Because that's required, right? I think it's evolutionary selection. I don't think there's anything selection. magical about it. I think that, you know, if you land in there and you are in the anti-sense orientation, you provide an advantage. And I, I think it's nothing more than that. So to keep the transposons quiet, which is really essential, uh, I, I wonder if I uh, extrapolate some of what you said to, to mouse or, or to mammals, uh, and uh, if, if it does require, because the, the, the other feature I think where, where there is some evidence for is that some transposons might actually never be reprogrammed, so they go through the germline yeah. actually silenced and you, you, yeah. how do you explain that well and is it possible that actually because the marks will will not go through the germline many of the marks that one measures uh, mm -hmm. early on they can't go through the germline so could it be that is, is, is there these are these pi RNAs uh, are, are they included in the sperm or in the egg are they passed on physically so we so sperm we looked at a lot um, so let, let me start at the beginning of your question, right? So, so pi RNAs are essential for setting DNA methylation marks on a subset of transposons in animals. And that subset is the young, transcriptionally active, close to consensus uh, transposon families. And so what happens during germ cell development is you have this pervasive demethylation. There are some elements that resist that. We don't think that they are targets of the pyronate pathway because they are resisting DNA methylation before these components are expressed. Then there's a default wave that happens, and that takes care of the majority of transposon content. But then again, that transposon content is inert, right? So it's not transcriptionally active. We think that these young transposons essentially mimic protein coding genes, so their, um, their promoter elements evade that default wave then pyronase come in and sort of clean up. And based on some fairly detailed DNA methylation analysis, um, H3K9 trimethyl chip, you know, that's sort of the model that emerges. Um, though we haven't, you know, sort of been able, because it's difficult to work with, you know, germ cells of embryonic mice, um, we haven't really been able to tweak the system in the same way that we have been in flies. So then these methylation marks are set. We believe that those marks are meiotically heritable. We don't believe that pi RNAs are transmitted in sperm. We've spent lots of time looking at sperm for small RNAs and haven't really found very much. Um, we certainly at least were never able to convince ourselves that we were seeing something over the level of, of just background contamination. Um, the, the oocyte is a more difficult question, um, and I think the answer there is we just don't know. I mean, they are present. The so presumption is that they could be transmitted. It, it is the most plausible. Yeah. It, cer it certainly happens in flies, yeah. and, and the way we know that is because we can look at, you know, very early embryos, and we can see phenotypes that arise when we manipulate, in one way or the other, the um, spectrum of pyronase that are transmitted. We haven't been able to do that yet in mammals. The scenario of the sense antisense, where you have the one base pair overlap, yeah. is, is that conserved, or is that like sort of a PAM sequence that in different species they, they, they have different, and, and that no, gives you different sort of active sites or targeting yeah. sites in the world? Everywhere you look, um, you see that. And that's a co it's a consequence of the biochemical <coughs> mechanism of the ping pong pathway, and the biochemical mechanism of the way argonaut proteins cleave their targets. So the ping pong pathway, defines a 10 nucleotide overlap between those, the, the sense and antisense pyronids. So it would be, it, it is random that it's always at a adenosine or it was? No, no, it's uh, always at an A because the antisense pyronids always start with a U. Now why is that? We don't know. Um, there are a number of hypotheses. A lot of argon argonaut proteins have a preference for a U in position one. Um, we have not been able to do enough biochemistry on the PeeWee proteins demonstrate that that's the case. The uh, nuclease that we identified as making, at least in some 
at least one of its roles is to make pyrene 5 prime ends, doesn't show a U preference in vitro, but we might have a cofactor now that focuses it. So it could either be at the cleavage step or at the selection step by the argonaut proteins that that U occurs, and then that defines the A at position 10. All right. So can you tell us about Maelstrom and how it fits into this? No. Did it come up in your screen? Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> Maelstrom is very confusing. And so, you know, it almost looks like it does different things in, in flies and mammals. And I, I just think, I mean, anything that I would say about that would be such pure speculation. It, it's a very tough problem. Hmm. I don't have any doubt that Maelstrom is a pyrene pathway component. In fact, you know, if you get rid of it in flies, and Julius Brennecke showed this, you, you actually still get, so you don't get transpose on silencing. You still get H3K9 trimethylation. What changes is the boundary, so the spread of trimethylation becomes greater. And so, I mean, that almost suggests that K9 trimethyl alone is not sufficient for silencing, unless something about the Maelstrom mutant alters the density of those marks or, you know, s something very strange like that. But I, I do, it's, it's clearly a part of this pathway, but exactly what it does is a bit mysterious. In flies? There's no DNA methylation in flies. I thought very early. There is no DNA methylation in flies. We, so what we have this done, data that no, we did it, okay? We did 200x bisulfite coverage of flies at multiple different developmental stages including those collected, you know, according to the literature under mistletoe at midnight, you know, wherever. <laughs> and we never saw any consistent 5-methyl um, C. There's a perfectly good RNMT. Yeah. But if you look at all DNMT2 only organisms and you do very deep bisulfite sequencing, you get exactly the same result. Oh, I, th I thought you just meant that in general. No. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah, and it's not. But I mean, you know, people, you know, there's there's this idea that there's this little whiff, and it's very specific places. But I mean, we we did this to death. It was actually the graduate student who did the um, somatic um, uh, cell-based screen. So you spent all the money you had left over. Exactly. Spent on QPCR yeah. yeah. um, Do the transposon transcripts um, make any secondary structures? I mean, I'm certain that they must. Um, what are you trying? Are you trying to get it? Are these making double-stranded RNAs that get processed? I don't know that that helps the targeting. There, there is still, I think, so, so while I think we understand something about how this pyrene pathway works, we don't understand a lot about how it initiates. And so if you, you know, so how does it reboot at each generation? And so the notion is uh, maternally deposited pyrenees and form the system, everything goes happy from there, right? But if you get rid of some of the, the major pyrene clusters by mutating a complex that is essential for, convert, for essentially defining them as substrates for entry to the pathway, you get something called ectopyrenase, pyrenase from other loci. And there's a very strong bias for pyrenase derived from loci where there's convergent transcription and where we showed years ago make um, endogenous siRNAs. So I wouldn't rule out so, so even though none of the stuff that I've talked about we believe goes through a double-stranded precursor or intermediate, um, there may be connections between the double-stranded RNA-driven small RNA pathways and the pyRNA pathway. Um, I don't think we have evidence that those depend on secondary structures because we do have structured loci in flies that make endo-SI RNAs, and I don't think those necessarily showed up as pyRNAs in the RDC complex mutants that did this. Though, to be sure, I'd have to go back and check. 
Neil? Yes. Elements, just because they happen to uh, transpose, um, is, is very compelling and very interesting. Um, do you have any idea whether there would be a similar mechanism for the, uh, for the CRISPR repeats? I don't, yeah, no. Because I, I, I don't. Uh, I don't know enough about how that pathway, how the initial processing steps in that pathway go. All right, uh, no further questions. So we'd like to thank you, Greg, very much again for a fantastic lecture.